you very much. Um, I think uh, I'm, I'm perhaps not the only one who also doesn't necessarily feel they know a great deal about digital ethics, so uh, uh, we'll see how this, this pans out. Um, what I want to do in this paper is to, I'm going to adopt what will become apparently a very broad definition uh, of digital agency uh, based upon the argument that the, the digital devices we use, whether it's the software uh, or the hardware, uh, essentially extend the human or the archaeological mind, if you like, by scaffolding or supporting uh, cognition. So essentially my definition of agential devices therefore runs the whole gamut uh, of digital tools and technologies that we use uh, and which become progressively back black boxed uh, as we uh, become increasingly complex and we apply various levels of trust, uh, reliance ex and place different expectations uh, upon them. And that leads to a sort of mixture of a vicious or, or virtuous uh, circle of relationships between us and the devices that we, we use. So the sorts of devices that I'm actually including under this sort of heading of agential devices uh, runs the range from you know, using a, a database through using a GIS in support of our interpretation, uh, linking and amalgamating data sets into uh, data-driven meta-analyses uh, and incorporating them in machine learning tools, uh, right the way through to the range of uh, automated devices uh, that we operate as archaeologists from remotely controlled uh, terrestrial and aerial drones, uh, remotely operated semi-autonomous and autonomous uh, surface and underwater vehicles uh, and lab-based robotic devices and biomimetic or anthropomorphic uh, robots which are starting to appear in archaeological contexts. And uh, many of these devices augment uh, archaeological practice in various ways, at the very least re tending to reduce routinized uh, and repetitive work in the office environment and also in the field. Uh, others augment archaeological work through data-driven methods uh, which represent, uh, store and manipulate information so as to undertake tasks that may well have been previously considered to be uncomputable uh, in the first place or at least incapable of, of being automated. Now whether you could actually apply uh, the idea of agency to these sorts of devices uh, is I guess uh, debatable. You know, they, they don't have uh, intent or responsibility or liability, for example. Uh, but right now, for the purposes of this paper, what I would suggest is that simply anything that we ascribe agency to uh, acquires agency as a consequence, uh, especially bearing in mind our tendency to anthropomorphize uh, the tools that we use. But what I'm not suggesting uh, here uh, is that these systems have, in some sense, a mind or consciousness uh, in themselves. Uh, which represents a whole different ball game as far as ethical issues uh, are concerned. So the context for discussing uh, ethics in relation to agential devices uh, is very current and timely, I think. Uh, for example, the proceedings of the IEEE special issue on ethical considerations in the design of autonomous systems uh, was published earlier this month. Uh, and the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society published a special issue on governing artificial intelligence, ethical, legal and technical opportunities and challenges uh, late last year. And in that issue, uh, Corinne Kath draws attention to the growing body of literature that's surrounding AI uh, and ethical frameworks, and the debates that are taking place over laws that are governing AI and robotics across the world. And she points to an explosion of activity in the last year with a dozen national strategies published and billions of pounds or dollars in government grants allocated. And she also notes the way that many of the leaders uh, in both the debates and the technologies uh, are based, tend to, uh, tends to be based in the USA, uh, which in itself presents an ethical issue in terms of the extent to which AI systems and their like mirror US culture rather than sociocultural systems elsewhere around the world. But from an archaeological perspective, I would suggest that it's in our interest to set professional standards to reduce professional risk both to ourselves and to the archaeological record. And it's also, I think, in our interest to set these standards ourselves uh, rather than rely on standards set elsewhere. And I think this is particularly important as we start to employ devices that acquire 
agency uh, and consequently uh, act alongside us uh, or with us uh, or on our behalf uh, or indeed in our place. Whether these sorts of standards actually constitute ethical codes uh, is in itself perhaps debatable. Uh, for example, Callum Chase recently asked why we use the term ethics when other, ethic, other technologies do not apparently have ethics associated with them, uh, warning that it might give the impression that these devices do indeed have some sort of moral agency, uh, or indeed that disagreements and debates concerning these devices um, assume a moral status. Um, I don't really want to get into that here, but I guess the basic point is that ethics is the term that is most commonly used, rightly or wrongly, uh, and so that's the one I'm going to use here. So whether we're talking about ethics or whether we're talking about standards, the first issue uh, is to determine the scope. And this can be, I think, approached from three directions. On the one hand, there's the ethics of the designers and developers uh, of the devices that we use. There's also the ethics of the device itself. Uh, and then there are the ethics of the users and decision makers who are using those devices. And in reality, of course, it will tend to involve a combination of any or all uh, of these. Uh, because after all, the, the users of these systems, uh, we, will be influenced by the ethical decisions that have been taken by the developers. And developers may implicitly or explicitly incorporate uh, their ethical perspectives in the devices themselves. Uh, there is, of course, the question of whether the devices uh, can be uh, full ethical agents. Uh, which would require them to be able to make explicit ethical judgments on their own behalf. Um, but I think that's likely to be a question for some point in the distant future. So really I'm going to be dealing, really thinking about the first and the third uh, of those uh, areas. Determining where we draw the lines, I think, is often not all that straightforward. Um, for example, this is a table in a paper by Lindsay Robertson and her colleagues and uh, it seeks to illustrate the alignment uh, between ethical agency and autonomy. I think perhaps from an archaeological perspective, we might see the line that is being drawn uh, as falling between implicit and explicit uh, agency. And that would emphasise that the role of the devices that we use uh, is very much focused upon support. Uh, it assists and complements uh, us, us as the human user. And I think that would seem most appropriate from an archaeological perspective. According to James Moore, implicit agency in uh, devices avoids unethical outcomes by implicitly incorporating ethical behaviour uh, in the software, so th in things like de uh, de decision design, uh, support systems, uh, autopilots and the like. And that ensures in some way their correct behaviour uh, by without actually having ethical judgments explicitly uh, encoded in them. Do we wish to conceive of a situation, for example, uh, where a device acts as an autonomous moral agent uh, within archaeology, with very limited reference, if any, to the human archaeologist? For instance, uh, Juan Bacello has proposed a specialised uh, automated archaeologist that's capable of learning through experience to associate archaeological observations with explanations and using them to solve archaeological problems. It seems to be, you know, I, I guess a fairly distant proposition, but it certainly seems to raise a whole series of ethical challenges. But I think this table's uh, representation does focus on the ethical agency of the device. In this particular instance, the example is the car. Uh, and its relationship with the user, but what it doesn't explicitly incorporate uh, are the ethical agency of the developers who created these devices in the first place. And indeed, contrary to this table, uh, and particularly, in particular the first row uh, of that table, I would suggest uh, that, uh, well, I'd certainly question that a device could actually have no ethical agency at all, uh, since its developers will have applied at least implicitly ethics in its creation. The intention of the developers, designers and programmers is going to be key in establishing the extent of the ethical behaviour of the device. And while the end user will still bear ethical responsibility for its eventual application, the developer side of the ethical equation uh, seems likely to be quite significant. And indeed, establishing human responsibility 
is a feature of the proposed legal arrangements concerning robotics and artificial intelligence in the European Union. For instance, it emphasizes the, uh, visit, the need to ensure the visibility uh, of the makers, designers, data scientists, suppliers and companies responsible for creating artificial agents, as well as all the other actors who interact and use them, the workers, employers, consumers, patients, users and trainers. And I think that emphasizes that above all, the ethical imperative always lies with the human elements, ensuring that, that humans, archaeologists, cannot avoid uh, responsibility by devolving uh, it upon the device itself. So I think there can be several interrelated ethical concerns uh, that are identified in relation to archaeology. Uh, and this is just a series of interrelated uh, examples. So for example, in, in terms of control and oversight, I think that really emphasizes the importance of uh, retaining archaeological supervision of the devices that we use, not devolving responsibility uh, for action uh, to the system itself. And that could go so far as to argue for resistance against a fully automated, autonomous approach to archaeological agential devices. Devolving decisions to machines uh, does indeed erode our critical abilities, as we see in everything from aircraft and vehicle automation to satellite navigation. And at the same time, retaining appropriate levels of supervision requires knowledge of the origins, assumptions, methods and operation of the <coughs> devices if we're to be able to use them properly. So ethical control and oversight sets the bar for knowledge about these systems much higher than is frequently the case at present, where we often employ tools without necessarily having a full understanding of them. And it also raises the question of where this oversight lies uh, and with whom. Augmentation and replacement refers to the implication of digital devices in questions of technology replacement, threatening the displacement of individuals who perform mental as well as physical labour. Now that might seem a fairly remote uh, threat for archaeologists, not least because of our reliance on complex sensorimotor skills, which are as yet quite problematic to implement in automated devices, uh, and also the challenge of artificial intelligence operating outside quite discrete, well-defined and limited application areas, which isn't necessarily a characteristic uh, of archaeology. Nevertheless, the question of, of replacement does need to be considered. Are we content to see aspects of the craft and profession of archaeology replaced by digital devices? If so, it again underlines the, the importance of retaining oversight. Augmentation, on the other hand, is perhaps something that we're much more familiar with. Uh, digital semi-automated assistance with routinized and repetitive work and devices which operate in otherwise inaccessible or unattractive uh, locations, for instance. But retaining emphasis on the human actor at the centre of the process as an active participant rather than an observer, uh, an archaeologist in the loop, if you like, should make it possible to avoid overly scientific, uh, positivistic or instrumentalist approaches to the past. Algorithms are frequently characterized as black box procedures and processes which make software and the devices that are running them uh, appear inscrutable. And leaving aside the undesirability of uh, not knowing how something has been arrived at, inscrutability can also disguise a range of hidden biases, uh, which whilst they may ultimately have their <coughs> origins in the human biases of the original creators will ultimately impact on the, e the system's outputs in the form of discrimination or cultural bias, as has been famously demonstrated in recent examples of facial recognition systems, for example. Of course, the key issue here is that these are hidden, uh, obscured by the black box processes, and these can perpetuate and reinforce them and make them very difficult to surface. Uh, the requirement of explainability turns out to be something that's quite surprisingly controversial. For example, it's quite often argued that explanations may be unnecessary when the decisions uh, being arrived at are not crucial uh, or where there are no unacceptable consequences. However, for the sorts of reasons that I've just described, it seems to me at least to be unwise to accept the implementation of black box systems without some degree of explainability built into them, although the means by which this is achieved may be open to debate. So simply put, 
we shouldn't black box archaeological systems that classify or categorize data, for example, without requiring some understanding of the basis upon which they draw their conclusions. This is crucial with things like machine learning systems, for example, but it's equally true with more basic analytical tools, although the locus for the explanation will change accordingly from device to human. The issue of re re reproducibility, of course, has come to the fore in the context of open science more generally, but it's equally relevant in this context. With basic analytical tools, we can generally assume that a process is reproducible, <coughs> in that given the same inputs, the same outputs will result given unchanged functionality. However, when we're dealing with AI and machine learning systems, it's not necessarily the case as they adapt to, to new data and new inputs, and so may provide different conclusions. So reproducibility in this sort of context can be quite problematic without very detailed information about the internal pipelines and decision-making processes applied in each case. Uh, which could then in principle be used to recreate the sequence uh, adopted at any particular stage. Trust inevitably, evidently entails knowledge of the inputs and the processes so that we can have trust in the outputs. But this is extended to include trust in the actions and the ability to direct human action as well as verify outcomes in place of human intervention. So this should make the transparency and explainability of these devices all the more important. But ha having said that, that, there are plenty of studies that show that devices are frequently used without real consideration and their authority is accepted without question. Uh, for example, sat satellite navigation systems are notorious for taking a navigational cognitive load uh, upon themselves and consequently leading drivers who are insufficiently aware of their surroundings into undesirable or even dangerous situations. Linked to questions of authority is automation bias. The increasingly routinized use of these devices can lead to them being taken for granted, with the devices simply seen as a means to an end and their outputs accepted unquestioningly because they derive from the device rather than from another person. And this is related to the kind of fetishization, habituation, and enchantment associated with our expectations of use of these devices. For example, in a recent study looking at the adoption of algorithms, it was found that simply knowing that other people were using a particular algorithm made it much more, more than twice as likely to be adopted, in, even in the face of knowledge that that algorithm gave imperfect results. So over recent years, I think archaeology has been transitioning towards more computerized, automated practices. But I'd suggest that our consideration of the ethical implications of this has rather lagged behind. And this is compounded by the way in which digital devices are increasingly moving into areas that we might previously have thought uncomputable, where, for example, the combination of big data approaches and machine learning enables computers to perform tasks that might have been thought to require cognitive ability and improve themselves with little or no human intervention. In this context, therefore, the need to debate the nature of ethics associated with these tools and their subsequent use becomes all the more critical. Thank you very much.